Hello, and welcome back. So in this short lecture, I'm going to talk about possible costs and benefits of critical thinking. So we've already talked a good deal about the benefits, but just to be clear. Uh, so the main benefit is that we're more likely to believe truly and not believe falsely. And that's important really for two main reasons. One is that it's useful for effective action. Uh, beliefs based on, uh, actions based on true beliefs more likely to be effective, actions based on false beliefs less likely to be effective, and also we might just be curious. We might want to discover, well, how is the world, and uh, have true beliefs about how the world is, and that's going to require doing a good job of reasoning, and critical thinking will help us with that. Also, critical thinking uh, helps to promote our own autonomy, our own ability to live our own lives, and this is something that was important to Socrates. It uh, can help us defend against error, manipulation, and prejudice by others, uh, so certainly political figures want to tell us what to do, uh, advertisements tell us what to buy, religion wants to tell us what to do and what to believe, and maybe the products are good and the advertiser's looking out for us, and maybe the religious figure is sincere and has uh, maybe even true religious beliefs and certainly helpful advice, and maybe the political figure really would be good to have in power. Or maybe not. And critical thinking is a way of helping us make our own decisions about those issues that other people might be trying to uh, get us to do. And it's not just defense against the manipulations of others, but helping us to become clear about what we matters to us, uh, how we might achieve it, and developing a coherent and reliable worldview. And these ideas are all things that you see in Socrates. And this is really about us being able to think for ourselves, to take uh, responsibility for a part of our life, a, a big aspect or a big aspect of our life that runs throughout almost all of our lives, what our beliefs are, how we're thinking about the world. But it's not just being uh, sort of our own lives, but it's also part of our communal lives because a lot of our communal life involves communicating. A lot of our lives are communal and it involves communication, and there are lots of things we do that together that don't involve reasoning, but there are lots of, you know, saying being a sports fan doesn't necessarily involve lots of reasoning, although sports fans do like to have debates about, uh, you know, who's the best player of all time, and but, you know, whatever, it's different uh, sports and, and so on, um, you know, what strategy should the team use, and so even there, there is reasoning, but there are different ways in which uh, it's, that communal aspect is important. One is that we can learn from others and we can do a better job if we're able to better evaluate the reasoning that they're putting forward. Uh, also, being able to reason well can help us to reach understanding with each other by being clear about what our reasons are and being able to communicate those clearly. Even if we don't end up agreeing, that understanding that we can reach of each other can be valuable. And we may even reach consensus by doing a better job of reasoning publicly with each other. So there are lots of benefits, I think, to reasoning and to critical thinking. The text discusses a number of costs that we might worry about. So one idea is that critical thinking involves a lot of negativity, or as it was put in lecture, uh, trolling. So we might worry that maybe Socrates is a troll. I don't think he is. Um, he's not out there just trying to sort of uh, bait his opponents into getting angry, right? He, in fact, a troll typically says things to evoke reactions, um, and then the troll laughs at the person who's reacting. Uh, and Socrates isn't doing that, and he's not doing it to just anybody. Remember that Euthyphro claims that he knows what piety is, and it's only on the basis of that claim that Euthyphro has made that Socrates then says, oh, you know what it is? Tell me what it is. And it's then things you know fall apart for Euthyphro. And maybe Socrates is trolling him a little bit with some of his ironic sort of, oh, you know, Euthyphro, you know what uh, piety is, please teach me, as he just keeps repeating that throughout the dialogue. There may be reasons why Socrates is being sort of ironic in that way um, and not putting forward his own view that actually Euthyphro you don't know. The other sorts of uh, things we might see here are oh, people saying, oh, you're being irrational or you're being emotional in your reasoning and thinking that somehow that accusation in and of itself is critical thinking. So I'll talk about those in a second, but I want to point out that there are purposes to critical thinking besides criticizing others' beliefs. I've just been talking about that. So we can target our own reasoning that might even involve not buying into substantive negative views, like 
one kind of uh, psychotherapy is cognitive behavioral therapy, which is basically applied critical thinking. It's looking at our patterns of reasoning and saying, oh, do we have good reason to come to this negative view about, say, what we're capable of doing? And the critical thinking can demonstrate that, oh, maybe I don't have such good evidence for thinking I'm incapable of doing that, or thinking that everybody hates me, or whatever it might be, that sort of exaggerated view. So critical thinking actually might lead to positive, uh, sort of happier views by undermining unhappier views, if it turns out those unhappier views are not well supported by evidence. And it can also help us to discover new implications. It's not just saying this reasoning doesn't work, but by understanding better how reasoning does work, we might get better at seeing, oh, well, what does follow from the beliefs that we have? That said, um, there is an, sort of an aspect of critical thinking that might involve criticizing others' beliefs. So as I was saying, I don't think Socrates was a troll. And I do think in general it's okay to criticize another's beliefs, um, certainly in the case with Socrates, Euthyphro is out there making a strong claim that he knows what piety is. And he's not just, you know, it's not just he's not just thinking that, he's announcing it. And so that's sort of asking for a discussion. Now that said, saying you're being irrational is profoundly unhelpful. Um, it's not much better than saying you're stupid, which is not helpful. It's just insulting. And it's also not a substantive comment. It's not pointing out what the actual reason in error, the reasoning error is. So as we get better at detecting reasoning errors, we can be much more specific and much more helpful uh, about what those reasoning errors are. And it might also be possible to disagree with someone without being a jerk, even if you really care a lot about uh, what it is that you're uh, discussing. And this might be important to do. Other people's mistakes can be important. They can affect the other people's mistakes don't necessarily affect just them, those other, others' mistakes can affect lots of other people, and so it may be important to say, hey, hold on, like, you're making a mistake there. Of course, there is this cost that some people don't like their beliefs being criticized, and so uh, there can be this unpleasant side to critical thinking, but I would suggest that that's just part, it is a cost, and but it's also part of being in a community that we are able to say, hey, you know, to call each other to account and say, you have this belief, you're going to act on it, but it's going to affect others and we need to talk about that. And we may also just care genuinely about another person and think, well, you know, I would like to um, help them out. Or maybe it's important to our relationship that we be clear about what our beliefs are and reason together. You know, if you're in a, a, any sort of partnership with somebody else. Another concern you might have is that critical thinking will make you cold and unemotional, right? And indeed, our emotions can affect our beliefs, and the, you know, you might get excited about a political candidate, or a romantic partner, or a job. Um, anger can very straightforwardly uh, lead us to reason in, in quite irrational ways where we're very attached to being right and the other person's being wrong. Uh, we reason in various ways to protect our own self-image so that we arrive at views that uh, are compatible with us basically being a good people. So there are lots of ways in which emotions can affect ourselves, and some, and some of those ways uh, can lead to false beliefs. And false beliefs are unhelpful, and so it's good to avoid emotional distortion of belief. Um, but it may also be at the same time that emotions can help us reason. We'll think about that later. And avoiding the emotional distortion doesn't require overthinking, and it doesn't require you to turn your emotions off. It does maybe sometimes require you to step back from your emotions, um, but it doesn't require you to turn into a robot. Now, there are some views uh, that sort of run with critical thinking kind of far in a certain direction of sort of stepping away from emotions. So one view is a view called Stoicism. It's found uh, in the ancient Romans. And they had this sort of, this, this is uh, Marcus Aurelius, who was one Stoic philosopher and was also a Roman emperor, wrote a book called The Meditations. So he and other Stoics had this sort of following view. They thought that, well, changeable things are beyond your control, more or less. You might have a small influence on what happens, but for the most part, things that can change are being affected by a huge uh, variety of factors that are entirely beyond your control and that make most of the difference to the outcomes. And that means that changeable things are, are basically beyond your control. 
And because they're changeable beyond your control, they cannot provide true happiness. And in particular, one of the major problems that uh, changeable, uncontrollable things present is that we form judgments about them. And that, oh, I need this, I don't want that. And those judgments about them, you know, I, I, I want this to eat, I don't want that to eat, I want this person to like me, I don't want that person to like me, it's important that I get this job, it's important that I not get that job. And what the Stoics suggest is that most of the suffering that we undergo is as a result of all those judgments about what's happening and not actually what's happening. And so they think, well, look, um, we mistakenly think we need these opinions to somehow navigate the world or protect ourselves or something like that. But actually, most of this stuff just isn't worth caring about. And if we, and so there's this quote from a Marcus Aurelius, um, it is in our power to have no opinion about a thing, whether it happens or not, it's good or bad, and to not be disturbed in ourselves. For those things themselves have no natural power to make us, uh, to form our judgments. So whatever's happening, we just don't need to form judgments about it, and therefore, and thereby we avoid all this distress. And he thinks critical thinking can in various ways help us realize this. This is a pretty strong radical view, and we'll think about it towards the end of the semester when we apply critical thinking to happiness. Stoicism is not the only view that suggests that some sort of attachment to changeable things is the result of a lot of our suffering. You find that actually in many religions, and you find it very prominently in Buddhism, Although Buddhists focus much more on meditation as opposed to critical thinking, and we're actually going to spend some time uh, thinking about mindfulness meditation and how that might be uh, relevant to happiness and critical thinking. So we'll be getting to that later as well. A final concern you might have is that critical thinking is the enemy of creativity. And there is a kernel of truth to this. It can be a really bad idea to mix creativity and evaluation, uh, and to do them at the same time, because when you're constantly evaluating what you're producing, that can really hinder the creative process. That doesn't mean you don't want to evaluate what you're producing when you're trying to be creative. It suggests we should uh, divide creation and evaluation into separate states, sort of the creative aspect and the revising aspect, or the productive aspect and the revising aspect, into different stages of our work. And so this is certainly something that lots of artists do. So they create, and then they evaluate it, and then they change it, and then they come back and evaluate it some more, and it's, it was important for me in finishing my dissertation. And so having this division is valuable. You don't want to, it's, they're not very, they don't often mix very well at sort of to be done at the same time. But that doesn't mean that the critical evaluation is not important. It can be very important. It's how an artist can get better, and it also uh, helps lead to new theories. So Einstein's theory of relativity was uh, part of the, process that led to his producing a theory of relativity was a very clear understanding of what the holes in previous theories were. Uh, Darwin's theory of natural selection is another example of that in operation. So critical thinking, when mixed in certain ways with producing the productive aspect of creativity, can really hinder creativity, but when separated out, it doesn't do that, and it's a really important element of creativity, in fact. So, to summarize this, say, well, what are benefits? Critical thinking can help us have more reliable beliefs, it can help us be more autonomous to run our own lives, and it can also help us participate in community, achieving consensus and understanding and learning from others. Costs, sometimes other people don't like it when we criticize their beliefs. This is important, we're going to think about that cost, and uh, it can mix poorly with creativity if we're not careful with it. Okay, so those are some of the initial costs and benefits we're going to want to think as we proceed throughout the semester, what we think about that. And in the last uh, micro lecture for this unit, I'm going to be starting to produce some of those, uh, we're going to start talking about some of the tools that we're going to be using, some of those systematic elements by which we rationally evaluate our beliefs. So that's what we'll be doing in the final lecture.